All right. In 2013, while I was in college, I had, well, the only friend I ever made in college, his name was Andrew Celine. He lived in East Tennessee up in the mountains, and I love the mountains. So making friends with somebody that lived in the mountains was just an A-plus to me, and he was an awesome guy. Still is. Well, in 2013, I went that December, and I would always stay for at least two weeks. And this particular year, um, we had went, we had went camping, we had went hiking, and at his parents' house, we always stayed in the basement because it was basically the ultimate man cave. It was like its own separate house. It, it was like a wood fireplace with brick fireplace, and they had a big TV with two couches, pool tables. There were guns everywhere. We loved it. We felt like real men, and we would hang out down there. And well, one night it was probably two o'clock in the morning. He was on one of the couches, and I was on the other one. He had fell asleep, and I was up watching The Green Mile, because I think that's a really good movie. And during that movie, I began to get a pain in my stomach. And so I woke up Andrew, I'm like, hey man, do you have anything for an upset stomach? He says, hey, just go upstairs, go to the fridge, there's this stuff in there called kefir. Drink it, it'll help you. I'm like, okay, I trust you. I go up there, and I drink this kefir, which I have now learned is basically fermented yogurt, But it's supposed to be a a probiotic that's really good for you. Well, not knowing what it was and out of trust in my friend, I open the thing, chug it, and about 30 seconds later, I'm running to the bathroom and I throw it all up. It was awful. I was was so downstairs um, and I woke him up and I said, dude, you're an idiot. That that just made me throw up. That did not help at all. He's like, I'm sorry. Okay. So I, I lay down. I try to go back to sleep and the pain gets worse. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll get up. I'll, I'll, I'll try to go use the bathroom. That didn't work. I went and laid back down. I fell asleep for about 20 minutes. All of a sudden, I get woke up out of my sleep in just anxiety pain and just anxious pain. And my stomach was hurting and I was real nauseous. And I wake him up. I was like, dude, you didn't help me. Go wake up your mom. Moms are superheroes. She can fix the situation. He goes, wakes her up. We go upstairs. I, she, I tell her what's wrong with me. And she goes, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, okay, well, that plan worked. Thank you. I thought you were a superhero mom. But she goes back to bed. Me and Andrew are are hanging out in the kitchen upstairs. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, it just feels like somebody takes a knife and stabs me right in the stomach. And in this moment, I crumble, fold over. I fall on the ground, and I'm in a fetal baby position, and I'm crying. And I never cry. So this pain was just the, one of the worst pains I've ever been in. It was worse than me breaking my jaw and having my mouth wired shut for 12 weeks. But that's a story for another day. So he wakes his mom back up now that I'm crying. He knows something's really wrong. And she says, okay, we're taking you to the ER. And I fought it for like 30 minutes. I'm like, no, I'm not going. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to the doctor. I hate the doctor. So they load me up in the car. They finally convince me. She goes maybe 10 miles an hour and takes me to the hospital. And it is the absolute worst car ride of my life. Every little bump, every turn, just hurt. We get there, and to make the situation even better, the hospital we walk into is literally like something you would see on a a bad movie, a scary movie. It's this really long hallway with the half lights, they're not working. The other half, they are. And somewhere in the middle, there was a flickering light. And I remember walking through the hallway like this, and I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to die in this hospital. And so just, I, I'm, I'm worried and I'm afraid. They put me in my, my room, in the emergency room, and doctor comes back and says, hey, we've got to take a CT scan of you to kind of figure out what's going on, what your symptoms are, and what's going on in your stomach. But our CT scan is broke, so what we're going to do is we're going to put you in one of these ambulances, and we're going to take you 45 minutes to Athens, Tennessee, and we're going to do your CT scan there. They're going to load you up, bring you all the way back here, and then we're going to read it here, and we're going to figure out what's wrong with you. I'm like, okay, this is really stupid, but just leave me there at Athens, but that's, that's enough. So we go, I get the CT scan, I come back, the doctor comes in and he says, okay, we've got to get you prepped and ready for surgery immediately because your appendix is about to rupture. And if it does that, you're going to go septic and it's going to be a lot of bad issues. And some of you know what that's like. And so I'm like, okay, we get prepped. This is probably about five o'clock in the morning, going on six o'clock. And uh, my friend, he, it was, this is the middle of the week and he had to go to work. And so did his mom. They had to go to work. So they were there as I got ready for surgery. Um, I went back where they were going to put me to sleep. And I wake up from my surgery in my room, and nobody's around. I'm completely alone. 
I'm 600 miles away from any family. My family lived in West Tennessee, and I'm all the way in East Tennessee. There's nobody around me. I wake up after surgery. I got cuts in my stomach. I'm hurting, and I'm all alone. My bladder was hurting. I got up. I tried to, I took my little IV rack, and I tried to make my way to the bathroom. The nurse comes running in, yells at me, tells me, what am I doing? You're not supposed to be moving yet. I'm like, well, y'all weren't here to give me any advice. I just woke up, and I got to pee. And so, but the point is, in that moment, when I woke up and I realized, and I was only like 19 at the time, 600 miles away from home, my friends and family weren't there with me. I was worried, I was hurting, and I felt abandoned, and I didn't know what to do. And so what I want to talk to you guys about today is what do you do when you find yourself in an unexpectable situation? Do you get mad? Do you get depressed? Do you hurt yourself? Do you go drink? How do you, how do you handle that? And I share this story because if you remember last week, we talked about Joseph and his dream. Pastor Blake preached an amazing message about his dream and how his father loved him so much more than he did all the other brothers that he gave him that Dolly Parton coat of many colors. And, and he, he flaunted around like he just had all this pride like a peacock. And so he had this colorful robe on, and he was telling his brothers about how he had this dream that his sheaf was bigger than their sheaves, and that they were going to bow down to his sheaves. And his brothers were like, oh, you really think we're going to bow down to you? And it worked so well the first time that Joseph had another dream and said, hey, I'll share that with them too. And he said, well, there was the sun and the moon and then the stars, and they all bowed down. And, the, and his father's like, what, you think that your mother and I and your brothers were going to be bowing down to you? And so this made the brothers really upset, and they couldn't even stand him. And so we pick up the story here. Jacob, or Israel, it goes interchangeably in in the story as you read it. But Jacob decided he was going to send all the brothers to Shechem to go tend the flock there. That was about 50 miles away from their home. And so he tells um, Joseph, who had stayed back, He said, get ready, Joseph. I'm going to go send you to check on your brothers, and you'll come back and give me a report about how they're doing. So Joseph begins this trek to Shechem. He gets there, and they're not there. The story says that he's wandering around a field aimlessly, and the guy sees him and comes up to him and says, hey, dude, what are you doing? Why are you you just walking around this field? He says, well, I'm looking for my brothers. Have y'all seen them? And he, he says, yeah, I saw them, but they're not here anymore. I I overheard them talking that they were going to go to Dothan which Dothan was another 20 miles north of Shechem. So Joseph, after trekking 50 miles, learns that he has to go another 20 uh, 20 miles to go find his brothers in Dothan. And so we pick up the story right here. I want to read it to you. Follow along on the screen. We're in Genesis 37, 23 through 28. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. They looked up, and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and racin, going down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And they agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit And sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. A lot of us, we view life as this big thing that we don't really understand. And for many of us, we find ourselves in a pit. And the first point that I want to talk to you all about is that the pit has purpose. You see, for, for by being sold into slavery, by being thrown into that pit, Joseph was actually launched into his destiny. This is why the series is called Dreams to Destiny. It started with a dream, and this, this dream eventually helped lead him to his destiny that God had him. And sometimes God will allow some situations to come into your life that will make it feel like you are in a pit, but it's going to launch you into the direction of your destiny. And so if you're stuck in a pit for you right now, the best advice that I can give you today 
is to try and find what the purpose is, the purpose of why you were where you were at. Because, you know, as some of you have encountered before, and, I, and I've heard stories this week, and I've heard stories with Pastor Blake of being unemployed where it just seems like uh, I just can't find a job, and I find a job, and it just doesn't work out. And we just keep trying to force something to happen. And I'm not saying this is the case, but I want you to, to think about the perspective that what if maybe what you're trying to do and what you're trying to force and that job you're trying to get really isn't the very thing that God is calling you to do. And so maybe you're trying to go this way, but God is like, no, you need to go here because I'm going to use you over here. Or, 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 or maybe you, you've, um, you've been all alone and you've been afraid and you've been lonely and you haven't been in a relationship in years. Maybe you've been divorced or maybe you're young and, and you, all you want to do is you want to be in a relationship so you feel loved and you feel cared about and you feel like you have a purpose. And God is saying, hey, no, no, no. You need to just seek first my kingdom. You need to seek first me. You run after me. And as you run after me, I've got somebody that's also doing that same thing. And when you both run towards me, you're eventually going to me. And so God is trying to sell that to you. But you're trying to force all these different things and you're dating losers. Okay, so we want to we wanna fix our focus and try to find the purpose. Or maybe you're depressed. And you feel like you're in a, pre a pit of depression and you're so sad and you, sometimes you don't want to wake up in the mornings, you don't want to get out of bed, go to school, go to work, come to church, go to small group because you're depressed. Because for so long and so many years you've been pushing things down in your life that need to come out, whatever that may be. As Pastor Blake said last week, he kind of hit on this, but I want to hit on it a little bit more. Metropolis has this idea that Metropolis is just this big pit, right? Nothing can happen here. This is just it. Nothing, nothing can happen in Metropolis when, when it's just this big giant pit and all there are are addicts and people that just want handouts and they want this and they want that. There's nothing that can happen here. But listen, church, if this place called Metropolis is a pit, then that means we have a purpose as a church. It is up to us to get into the pit with these people, that addict that you see walking down the street that has, that has had DUIs and have had their license taken away and they walk around and they're either on drugs or they're walking around drunk, they need Jesus. So you've been passing by them and you've been hearing that little voice in your head, man, I just need to give that guy a ride and show him the love of Christ. Stop and do it. Pick him up. It's going to be uncomfortable. But that is a purpose. That is something that you can do. Or, or that, that, that teenager that you know that lives a couple of houses down from you uh, in a house that's family is very abusive and they don't know what love is. All they see is their parents fighting, their, their parents hit them, and they're hurting, and you know this. Maybe God has placed you on that street to invite that kid to church, load them up in your car and bring them to the house on a Wednesday night or the life kids on the weekend or whenever. You have a purpose for where you're at. And so that's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on these things, that, that classmate, that coworker that, that, you don't, that you don't even like, that annoys you, that all they do is talk, and they're always there in your personal space, and you're like, I wish they would just get away from me. But inside, they are hurting. They are begging for a connection because they themselves are lonely. When they go home from work, that is, they don't have any more connection. And so they need the love of Jesus to shine through you to say, hey, man, I'm your friend. I'm here for you. Hey, you're lonely? Hey, I've got this great place on East 3rd Street that would love you. They would love on you. They would welcome you in. They'd give you free donuts on Grandparents Day. So, like, you will love this place. Bring them. But for us, I, I've learned that when, when we're in this pit, when I find myself in a pit, all I do is focus on the things that are around me and behind me and that are encircling me. That person that left, that, that friend that betrayed me. That person that lied to me or that person that said something bad about me or that, that thing that happened that I had no control over. All I do is focusing on those things instead of focusing on my eyes up on the one who has set me free and the one that wants to pull me out of that pit. And so instead of focusing your eyes all the way around, it's time for us to look not outward but upward. And so that's what we want to do as a church. If you are in a pit this morning in your life, it is time to look up and stop looking around and trying to do things on your own. And so that's what I want to preach to you about is that the pit ain't the problem. The pit has purpose. And a lot of the times, the problem is us. The lies that we tell, the, the things that we do, the, the things that we've done in our past, the things that have been done to us is the problem, not the pit. 
So don't pity the pit. I got lots of peas today, so y'all get ready. Joseph, you guys remember, he was full of pride. Like Blake said, he thought that dream was a, a dream about position, but really it was a dream about God's purpose. And so, and so Joseph had to learn a lesson while he was in the pit. He had to learn that that pit had purpose. And that's what we have to do. While Joseph was in that pit, and his brothers had threw him, Reuben, one of his brothers, had actually tried to convince the brothers, hey, don't kill him. Throw him in this pit, but just leave him there. And in his mind, he's thinking, okay, we'll throw him in the pit. I won't kill him. Later, I will come back, and I will set him free. But it wasn't just because Reuben loved Joseph. He actually had intentions to get back in good grace with their father Israel. Because if you know the story, or if you don't, I'm going to teach you that Reuben had actually slept with his father's concubine. And so he had laid in the bed with his father's prostitute. And so he wasn't in good standing with his father. So he thought, okay, if I rescue Joseph and I bring him back safely, then Israel is going to love me again. Father's going to love me. And then he will, he will recognize that I'm not as bad as what he's thinking right now. But Joseph was in that pit. And Reuben had went to go check on the flock. And the, the Bible says that he came back and they had already sold him. And he looked in the pit. He tore his clothes out of remorse. And he looked at his brother. He said, what am I going to do now? Where is my brother? What am I going to do? They, were, they literally sat right next to the pit as, as Joseph begged and cried and pleaded, please, brothers, let me out. I don't know what I've done. I don't know why I'm here. Why would you betray me, your own flesh and blood? You've thrown me in a pit to die. And Joseph is in there begging them to let him out while they sit just above and eat a nice Kentucky Fried Chicken meal. David Guzik said it like this. He said, the heartless character of these brothers was clear. They could eat a meal with Joseph nearby in the pit. They could sit down and enjoy food while the hearts were bent on murdering their brother. We learn later in, in chapter 42 that they actually mention how guilty they felt for remembering that moment when they were eating their meal and their brother was suffering in the pit. As they cried, they just sat there and eat, and they felt remorse for what they had done. And they begin to ask for forgiveness for, from Joseph, and, and I truly believe that they were really sorry. But I've also learned something, too, about, about people today and I'm sure there was people just like this back in that time. You see, these brothers, they were truly sorry. They were repenting for what they had done. They truly wanted forgiveness. But I've learned in my experience that a lot of times people only say sorry when they finally get caught. And so when the truth comes out, that's when they're sorry. And that's a bad place to be because that means there's no repentance that has happened. It is just, oh, wow, I've been found out. What, well, the light has been shown on what I've done. And so, oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me, please forgive me. But that's not what they did. But it took them 25 years for them to realize, because in chapter 42, that was about 20 or 25 years later. It took them that long to realize the horrible act that they had done, to come to terms with what they had done and be honest about it. So if you've done some things in your past, don't wait 25 years to, to come to grips and to repent and say you're sorry. You have the opportunity today to be honest, because God already knows what has happened. And so you have an opportunity to get, start walking in the right direction and, and in the purpose that God has for you. Anybody remember the story of Susan Smith back in 1995? Y'all remember that name? Terrible, terrible lady. She, uh, if you don't know the story, she was a mother, had a couple children, and she drowned her own children. Drowned them then went on national television in front of the whole nation and then begged for whoever had kidnapped her children to come and bring them back. She put on this false face of sadness and, and just despair and, and brokenness. Just the, 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 the fact that she could lie like that shows the depravity of the human heart and how sad and how wicked we can be as people. But the pit is not the problem. The pit has purpose. But not only that, but the pit has a, is a provision. Provision just means provide. The Lord provided. The Lord provided. If you all ever had some things happen and you just didn't really realize that it was God until afterwards, and then you're like, oh, hey, that was God. Y'all ever had those moments? I have. I have. 
For me, I've been trying to, trying to recognize and identify when God is doing these unseen provisions. He's kind of working behind scenes like the media booth. They're making all these things happen and we never see it. It's the same thing with God. A lot of times he is moving and shaking things around in our life so we don't have to worry. And for me, this is a couple of personal examples and maybe you can relate. But if I'm driving down the road and I've got a destination and I miss my exit, you can guarantee I'm mad at myself. I am really, really mad. I'm like, Bruh! but I've been trying to learn that maybe, and maybe it's not always, but I'm just trying to think, maybe God just allowed me to miss that exit to help me avoid a crash. Or maybe if you have that flat tire and you've got that appointment that you got to get to, but now you're stuck on the side of the road and your tire's flat. Maybe God was delaying you for something better. Or maybe he was delaying you to help you avoid something. And so I'm just trying to fix my, fix my eyes on different things that are going to point me towards God. And so that's what we want to do, and that's what I want to encourage you to do. Start trying to see where God's unseen provisions are and what they look like. Because sometimes I believe we give way, way too much credit to the devil, especially as Christians. Something happens, something goes wrong in our life, and what do we do? Oh, pfft, stupid devil. He's just trying to get me today. We're like, not today, Satan. But sometimes it's really not always the devil, so we need to stop giving him so much credit. Sometimes it's just ourselves. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's God providing an unseen thing. And so we really need to realize that, hey, we don't need to just acknowledge that it's the devil all the time, but we really need to recognize that either it's us, it's the devil, or it's God providing for us. Because they said right here in verse 20, 25, then they sat down to eat a meal. They looked up, and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. This is exactly that. Joseph has been thrown into this pit. And I want you to understand that it was not God convincing these brothers, hey, you all need to throw your brother into the pit because I have this plan for him. No, that was not it. It was the desire and the jealousy and the hatred that the brothers had for Joseph that ended up putting Joseph in the pit. It was not God. But out of God's goodness, out of his provision and his unseen plan, God provided a way to stop that human plan of killing Joseph. He, God stopped him from just staying in Shechem, sent him to this town called Dothan, which was actually a very well-known trade route. They throw him in the pit, and what's the chances that this Ishmaelite trading route is going to be coming, and then the brothers are going to say, hey, let's just sell him and make some money off of him. That was God providing because God knew what the brothers were going to do. He said, okay, y'all can do all these evil things, but I've got a plan, and I know how to get around it. But the pit doesn't always look like a provision. It doesn't always look like a path. It doesn't always look like it's going to get you anywhere, but sometimes the pit will become a pathway that's going to lead you into Egypt to where you're supposed to be. Whatever that may look like in your life, wherever you need to be, whether it's that job that you're supposed to be to or that, that ministry that you're supposed to be doing or that person that you're supposed to be with, that pit that you're in right now is going to turn into a pathway, just like it did for Joseph. If you all are familiar with the book of Jonah, when Jonah was being stupid on the boat and the sailors threw him overseas and he's drowning covered in seaweed, it says that the Lord provided a fish. The word is manah, the same word that they used to say manna, that the bread substance that came down from heaven. Manah means provided. And the word says that the Lord provided a fish for Jonah. But in that moment, I don't think Jesus or Jonah uh, circled and choking on his seaweed really thought that the Lord was providing. If I get ate by a big giant fish or whale or whatever you want to call it, I'm not going to be like, thank you, Jesus, for providing this fish to swallow me. Like, No. But, jo but Jonah wrote it from a past perspective. He, after everything had done, he realized that it was God providing for him. And so that's what we have to begin to do. And that belly, it was a representation of the tomb that Jesus went into. Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights, and Jesus was like, yeah, dude, I know something about that, about being in a dark place where there doesn't feel like there's any hope. And the same thing for Joseph here in the pit. The Lord provided a pit. The pit represents the tomb. So when Joseph was in the pit, I doubt he had much hope. He's like, well, this is it. My brothers have turned against me. They're selling me. I'm done. No one is ever going to know what really happened to me. And Jesus is like, man, 
I know a little about, about a place where there seems like there's no hope. But the pit pulled him down from his position of pride. He was saying, your, your sheaves will bow down to my sheaves. You see, the, the pit could have been his grave, but the pit ended up just being a pit stop until he could be led into the destination where he had, where God was calling him. And just like for Jesus, the tomb could have been the grave of Jesus, but it was just a pit stop. Listen, church, just because a situation in your life has landed you in a pit, it does not mean that your life is over. You are not always going to be depressed like you think you are. You are not always going to be alone like you feel like you are. You are not always going to be unemployed, and you're not always going to be a, a slave to debt. You're not always going to be these things that are haunting you and pulling you down. It's because our God is so good that he can take an evil thing like his brothers trying to throw him into the pit, wanting to kill him, wanting to sell him to make a profit. God is so good, church, that he wants to take an evil thing and he wants to use it for his good, for his purpose. But Joseph had to trust the provision. It says in, verse, uh, in chapter 29, verse 2, it actually says that the Lord was with Joseph and he became successful. Which kind of leads me into my final point, is that the pit is a peace. The pit is a peace. I gave you all a puzzle piece. Did everybody get a puzzle piece? Got a little one? Let me see, I think I got mine in my pocket. Y'all got it? Just hold on to it for a minute because you're going to need it. I want you to just hold it in your hand. For a lot of us, we downplay our emotions. Somebody asks us how we're doing. Man, I'm good. Well, well actually, you know, this thing happened this week, you know, that, that, that person hurt me or I lost my job. But hey, a lot of people out there, they got it a lot worse than I do. So I don't even have the right to complain. No, really, you do. It is okay to not be okay. You do not have to disrespect yourself by lying to yourself and saying that what you're going through is trivial. Because it's not. What you're going through matters. And it matters to God and it matters to this church. So don't disrespect yourself by downplaying the situation that you're going to, going through. Or, or with many of us, we have this fear of abandonment. We're so afraid that the, the few people that we have around us are going to leave us. Well, if, if, if I don't just act perfect, if I don't do everything I can to make you happy, you're going to think that I'm a bad person and you're going to leave me. And we have this fear of abandonment, so we do all these bad things. We say these things. We do stupid things. It's like a teenage boy that is trying to get her in a relationship. They say these stupid lies to get the girl to like them, and then it ends up very bad for the guy. It, it, it's, I've been that guy, okay? So we don't want to be like that. We don't have to worry about that. And Joseph's brothers abandoned him. They were going to leave him in the pit to die, but then they decided to sell him and make a profit. They abandoned him for 20, 20 pieces of silver, not even the going rate for a slave that day. And I want you to understand this principle, is that abandonment is not the measure of your value. Just because you are abandoned, just because that person left you, just because that job lets you go, just because these things have happened in your life, that is not uh, determined what you are worth. God determines what you're worth. So no amount of money, no amount of a person's like, nothing like that matters. It does not determine your value. So just because these things have happened, shift your eyes. If you guys remember, Jesus had actually been sold for 30 pieces of silver. When Judas betrayed him, they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And I told the teenagers this, I was like, and some of y'all, I know y'all play Pokemon Go and y'all play other video games, so maybe some of you will still relate to this. But... Like, I'm pretty sure Jesus is worth th more than 30 pieces of silver. Like, if he was a Street Fighter character or he was some kind of Atari character or Pokemon character, like, his stats would be 99. He's got, like, 99 wisdom. He's got 99 temptation resistance. He's got 99 healing ability. Like, all these things are, like, pretty awesome. He's the best of the best. And they were going to sell him for 20, 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, the Son of God, is definitely worth more. And just because jo uh, Judas abandoned him did not mean that Jesus was any less valuable. And that's the same for you. Y'all know that song that we, we sing, that uh, no longer slaves, it's been, it's been a while since we've done that song, where it says, you unravel me with a melody, you surround me with a song. 
We sing that outwardly, but on the inside, we're singing a remix. We've got our own personal remix. We're like, you abandoned me in my misery. You surround me with a pit. And that's how we view it. We view our life as a pit, and we're just surrounded by all these things, and we can't even offer up worship to God. We can't even give, a, it, we can't give any of our money because we're tied to our bills, and we're tied to all these different things when it's not ours to give anyways. And so here we are. Joseph feels abandoned. He gets sold. His brothers take his robe, rip it up, pour goat's blood on it, take it back to, to Israel and say, is this your son's robe? Is it or not? Tell us. And his father says this in verse 33. His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. Jesus, or Joseph has been torn to pieces. That was a lie. No vicious animal had devoured him. The lies that the devil has spoke to you, the lies that have been said about you, the things that have been done to you, those lies have torn you into little pieces. Our life is like a puzzle. And that's why you have that little piece with you right there. Your life is like a scattered puzzle. You've got all these events that happen in your life that create this beautiful picture uh, called life. But that's just it. That thing that, that Joseph just said, that was a lie. The animal had not devoured him. His brothers had sold him into slavery. So that piece that you're holding onto right now, that is not the whole piece to your puzzle. It's like this. We've got some of you. You got your wedding day, that event in your life. There's one of your puzzle pieces. Oh, fits right there. Some of you, you got a birth of your, your children, one of the greatest days of your life. And that's a part of your picture. For some of you, once you had your wedding day, y'all had an awesome honeymoon. It was great. Y'all went to Disney World. You went to the Bahamas. Some of you went to like weird places. I don't know but it was great for you, so it's great. It goes right there. But for some of us, in those moments, we also had a, a family death. Someone that we loved very dearly to us, they died and we didn't understand. We don't understand why. And it hurts us and we're broken on the inside and we're mad at God. And, and all we can think about is this, we can't focus on the wedding day we can't focus on the birth of our children. We can't focus on our kids taking our first step or your brother doing something good or your sister doing something good. No, all we can do is focus on this one piece where somebody died. Or that, or, that, or that time when you were a kid and you were abused, you were touched and you were hit and all these things happened to you and you've never gotten healing from it and so you are scarred physically and emotionally. You have the physical scars, but on the inside, you are also just torn to pieces because you have been abused. And that's all you can focus on. You, talk, you, you come in on the weekends and on Wednesdays and you hear people talking about the goodness of God, but then all you can think about is that one piece. And that's all you're focusing on. That is the pit that you see. For some of us, we were abandoned. This message is called the pit of abandonment because Joseph was abandoned by his brothers. But that's not the whole story. Joseph could have just thought the pit is it. This is all that it's going to amount to. Now I'm going to be a slave. I'm just going to be working until I die. And nobody's ever going to know. But he doesn't realize that that pit was just a pit stop. And it was going to deliver him into the purpose that God had for his life. And that it was going to one day be one of the pieces that completed his puzzle. And there's a ton of different other areas. Things are going to go on in your life that are going to fill in these empty pieces of your life. Some of them are going to be really, really good. And some of them are going to be really, really bad. And you're going to feel like you fell into another pit. But you are not alone. You are not abandoned. You have a purpose. God has a purpose for that pit. I, I, I wish that he could have talked to Jesus. Because you remember the story of Jesus when he died on the cross after he'd been betrayed and he had been beaten and he hung on that cross. And as he took on the weight of the world, the sin of the world, God no longer could look at Jesus. He had to look away. And in that moment, when God quit looking at Jesus, 
Jesus said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he learned what abandonment felt like. His father was not there for him for the very first time. So if you've been abandoned by your father or your family or your friends, Jesus can empathize with you now that he has done that. And so what Jesus has been through, everything that we encountered, Jesus himself went through himself. So he's empathizing. And I just want to close with this story. Do y'all know who Louis Zamperini is? Y'all familiar with his story? The movie Unbroken, he's got a book. If you don't know him, I'll give you a little background. But Louis Zamperini, in the war, he, he flew a bomb, a, a bomb plane. I don't know what else you call it. That's what I'm call it. A bomber. A little bomber. Well, he was over the ocean flying his bomber, about to do his bombing business. He gets shot down. And him and one of his people, they were in a raft floating in the ocean for 47 days. Like, I don't even know. Like, you're in a little raft. I, I got, in my first mission trip to Nicaragua, I ended up on a surfboard out in the ocean, and I thought I was just going to be ate by a shark, and I was going to be done. But he was on a raft in the middle of the ocean for 47 days. And God provided food and all these different things for him. And he wasn't even a Christian at this time. But he ends up getting saved, but not the good kind of saved by his allies, but by his enemies. They rescue Louis Zamperini and then take him to a prisoner camp. And while he's there, word gets around that he was also an Olympian, that he was a runner and had competed in the Olympics. And so the lead guy there that they called him the bird, he was their torture expert. He takes an interesting like in Louis Zamperini and he gives him special treatment. He gives him less food, less water. He gives him extra beatings, puts him in dark holes. He just absolutely tortures this guy for weeks. The war ends. He ends up getting saved, really rescued. But for Louis Zamperini, the war did not end. He gets back stateside and he begins to deal with PTSD. He gets diagnosed with PTSD. But this is during a time when PTSD wasn't really talked about. It really wasn't understood. So Louis handled it the way that he knew best. He went to a bottle. He began to drink. He became an alcoholic. And it tore his home apart. It got so bad to the point to where Louis Zamperini's wife said, me and the kids, we're gone. And he begged her, please, just stay. I will do whatever it takes. Just get, let me, let me have a chance. And she says, okay, there's this new guy up and coming preacher named Billy Graham. I want you to go to one of his tent revivals that's going to be nearby. And he says, okay, I'll go. And the very first night he gets there, uh, Billy Graham gets on stage and he says, you're all sinners and you're bad people and you're going to go to hell if you don't give your life to Christ. And Louis, in this, or Louis Zamperini gets mad in this moment. He says, I am not a bad person. I am a good person. I served in the war. I defended this country and I ended up in a raft. Why did I deserve that? I did not deserve that. And he gets mad and storms out. And so his wife comes back and says, all right, well, we're gone. He said, okay, okay. She said, just come tomorrow. Come again. Give it one more chance. So he comes back tomorrow, the next day, and Billy Graham begins to preach. And he says, some of you are lost at sea. And as you can imagine, this really resonated with Louis Zamperini. He said, you are lost at sea and you are searching for a savior. You feel lost and you you feel abandoned and you don't know what's gonna happen. And in that moment, Louis began to remember being out on that raft, And praying to God, God, please, if you are out there, I don't know if you are, but if you are, please save me. And he said, God heard that prayer. I didn't know if he would, but he did. He saved me from that. And he remembers looking out at nighttime, floating on his raft in the middle of the ocean and seeing millions of stars and thinking, wow, somebody out there created a beautiful masterpiece. And then that moment that night, Louis gave his life to Christ. But the struggles didn't end. He had to go to rehab. He he did the things to get healthy. And a few years later, he began his own ministry for helping war vets and and people with PTSD and people with uh, alcoholism. 
And then he also had the opportunity a few years later to, to go to one of the Olympics where the actual people that were the, over the, the imprisonment, the people that had beat him, the people that had scarred him were going to be there and he was going to have the opportunity to directly address them. And at this Olympics, he shook hands with them, said, I forgive you. And there had been rumor that the bird was not alive anymore. They, they think that he had killed himself, but nobody really knew. And so he never really had the chance to talk to him. But he wrote this letter and I want to read it to you. He wrote this to the bird. As a result of my prisoner war experience under the unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. It was not so much due to the pain and suffering as it was the intense, uh, the tension of stress and humiliation that caused me to hate with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights not only as a prisoner of war, but also as a human being were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain even dignity and hope to live until the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble, but thanks to a confrontation with God through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Christ. Love has replaced the hate I had for you. Christ said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and, it was, graciously and was graciously allowed to address all the Japanese war criminals at Sungamo Prison. I asked then about you and was told that you probably had committed harakiri, which is suicide, which I was sad to hear. At that moment, like the others, I also forgave you and now would hope that you would also become a Christian. Can you imagine being in Louis Zamperini's shoes, having fought for this country, had been become a prisoner of war, had been tortured and beat, became an alcoholic, suffered from PTSD, and then when God allows the opportunity, you forgave your enemies. You said, the, the pain that I went through, I knew it was bad, it wasn't right, but God had a plan and now I wanna forgive you. And the love that I have, I hope that it would bring you into salvation. And for some of us, some of you, you have never forgiven the people that, that hurt you, who abandoned you, your friend that you used to always hang out with, the friend you used to always talk to on the phone, that you shared all your secrets with. Y'all had one fight and you argued and now you don't talk at all. And you're confused and you're hurt and you're mad at him or her and you're mad at God and you don't understand why you can't even get along anymore. Or that person that abused you as a child. It wasn't right. It wasn't right. But you, 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 you are so scarred that you still have not healed. Or those, those people that wronged you, your co-workers, your friends, your family, they, they sowed lies about you behind your back and, and it hurt you and people decided that they didn't like you anymore. You've never gotten healing. You've never forgiven them. Emily and I, we, we have this, this saying, this quote on our wall that Mother Teresa said. And the very first line says, people are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyways. But some of us, we've never even forgiven ourselves. We are held captive to the struggles and the sins that have led us into the pit that we now sit in. The problems that we've endured, the things that we've done, the things that nobody would like us if, we, if they knew. We are, we are still stuck and, stra uh, and chained to these things. And we're in this pit way down and it's like it's on our neck and it's like we can't even look up. And God wants to set that free, but you gotta forgive yourself. You're in that pit and God is just saying, hey man, I am right here. Take my hand and I will pick you up and I will show you why you were there and I will show you the purpose and the destination that you're gonna eventually have. If you know the story of Joseph and how it ends, big famine happened. Nobody had food, it was scarce. And his brothers came out of Canaan. And Joseph was now second in command to Pharaoh. He was over everything, basically. And his brothers come, they don't recognize Joseph. And they beg for food, sir, please, we have money, we will pay for this food. And Joseph, recognizing that his brothers doesn't reveal himself, but yet he puts them through a series of tests. 
And afterwards, he reveals himself and he says, it's me, I'm Joseph. I'm the one that you threw into the pit and sold into slavery. And that, that's when they realize, oh my God, he is still alive. And now he is in second in command over the house of Pharaoh. He is now the guy that we are at the feet begging for food. What does Joseph do? He doesn't say, ha, I'm going to give you what you got now. You want some food? Nope. No, he doesn't. He says, what you meant for evil, God used for good. And that's exactly what God does. Those bad situations that you're in, the things that you're in right now, God is going to work for the good. That's exactly what eight, Romans 8.28 is. For all things work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so this is a perfect example of that. The, the enemy wanted to knock Joseph out and use the hatred of his brothers to just kill him and get him out of the picture. But God said, no, I will take this evil thing and I will create something beautiful where Joseph has the opportunity to show grace, to show compassion, to show love, the same grace, love, and compassion that God wants to show you today.